Now let's jump down to verse 12. Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you as though some strange thing happened unto you. We've said this before, he is preparing them for trials. And for many of these particular saints, they are going to literally pass through fiery trials. Mm -hmm. Nero, as referred to before, one of his preferred methods of, of persecuting and trying to just squelch this, this rising Christian movement is to burn the, the Christian saints. And so here's Peter using this phrase concerning fiery trials. I think that's more than just flowery words. I think it's literal foreshadowing for what many of them are going to face in the future. And some of you are probably thinking to yourself, well, then why in the world are they finding the ability to stay when there's so much intense persecution from without? Brothers and sisters, I, I could be wrong, but I don't believe that the external pressures of the world are ever the ones that cause us to lose our faith or lose our covenant connection to Christ. The external storms, if you let them, will actually cause you to hold on tighter to your covenants, to progress even more. It's only when we let the external storms become internal doubts and internal fear where we shrink back in our heart, in our mind, in our soul, when we choose internally to let our agency now focus more on the amusements of the world or the pulls and the tugs of the world or the temptations of the devil rather than on the, the invitations, the commandments, the directions, the love of God, that's when we start to disengage. That's when we let go of our covenant connection with Christ. It's not the external fiery trials. It's the internal uh, battles that we start uh, intentionally giving up on. That's when we start to let go. So Peter builds upon this saying, you need to be prepared for trials. In fact, you should expect that God will challenge you first. If he has elected you and chosen you, he's also going to refine you. Verse 17, for the time has come that judgment must begin at the house of God. And if it first begun at us, what shall the end be of them that obey not the gospel of God? And if the righteous scarcely be saved, where shall the ungodly and the sinner appear? Wherefore, let them that suffer according to the will of God commit the keeping of their souls to him in well-doing as unto a faithful creator. Meaning, expect to be challenged, expect trials, and let that be a witness to you that God knows you and he's helping you to become more like him. So he finishes this first general epistle in chapter five with some beautiful instructions to the elders, the leaders of the, the group in, in these different areas. And then he comes down to verse six. Humble yourselves therefore under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you in due time. The idea that you, you are going to have to pass through these fiery trials, but God will exalt you in due time. Verse 7, casting all your care upon him, for he careth for you. Have you ever stopped to think about it in this context? He careth for you. If I cast upon him all my care, then he's the one who cares. Let's modify that word for a minute. Then he will carry my burdens for me. Have you ever had that experience where you're in a situation in a setting where there's all this pressure to perform or to do something or to accomplish something and you feel the, the level of stress rising and maybe it gets to a level that you might call anxiety where you're feeling so much pressure and it, it actually causes you to not perform very well. It's almost paralyzing in its effect this would be a verse that could help us in that moment of need. Casting all your care upon him, for he careth for you. Brothers and sisters, in those moments of struggle, if we can do a better job of instead of thinking, I, all by myself, have to do this. I have to figure this out. Instead, if we can say, oh Lord, I need thee please help me with this. 
the power of the Savior to come and help us carry those burdens and to lift those cares with us and for us. It's very real and it's powerful. Now, this isn't to say that if you do that every single time, it's a matter of pushing buttons and it'll always be easier. That, that isn't the case for everybody. The point here is, if I call upon the Lord Jesus Christ and I turn to him, whatever my situation in life is going to be, it will be better than if I don't turn to him. It, but the solution might not be as instantaneous as you would hope, and it may not be as complete as you had, had presupposed. But the point is we keep turning to him and trusting in his knowledge, his power, and his goodness. And we, we let him carry those burdens with us for as long as that is necessary. And he concludes this encouragement in verses 10 and 11 before then he gives the final salutation of who wrote the letter. It says in verse 10, but the God of all grace who hath called us unto his eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after that ye have suffered a while, make you perfect, establish, strengthen, settle you. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. A great encouragement after he's laid out the reality that, yes, life is hard and don't expect it to be a bed of roses 